Thank you very much, and a special thank you to uh, Sharon for inviting us to this uh, great meeting. Um, I'm sorry yeah, if my voice doesn't project too well, I'm just uh, recovering from a bit of a bout of uh, flu, man flu. Um, so, should we be repairing more aortic valves? Well, the answer to that is simple, yes. So, my talk is finished then. Uh, I guess I'll have to convince you a bit more then. Uh, so why should we bother with aortic valve repair? After all, uh, nowadays we've got a very uh, excellent group of uh, valves that we can put in uh, uh, surgically, such as the mechanical valves or the uh, bioprosthetic valves. And we've also, we're going to hear a lot more about uh, TAVIs later. And uh, you know, all these things enjoy uh, relatively easy technical uh, implantation and good hemodynamics. Well, uh, not many of you might realise this, but uh, having an aortic valve replacement is a considerable uh, sentence on the patient. And uh, if you can see from the graph there that uh, the 10-year survival after a valve replacement uh, is only about 50%. It's, it's really quite astonishing. Um, and the life expectancy reduction uh, is all, all the more important uh, as the patient's age at the time of uh, needing their valve replacement uh, is so that compared to an age matched population, whether you have a bioprosthetic or a, a mechanical valve, it doesn't matter. Your uh, outlook is a lot worse. And the, the reasons for these are obvious. Uh, you know, anticoagulated related hemorrhage, uh, thromboembolism, valve degeneration, uh, infection, paravalvular leak, etc. So. It's quite clear that if you've got a patient with a valve like this, that there's no option but to replace the valve. But what if you've got still a, a morphologically normal valve, but it's leaking? So who can we consider aortic valve repair for? Uh, so basically it's a group of patients with either aortic root dilatation, and we're concerned about the aorta, but their aortic valve function is still normal. Uh, it seems a shame to, to, to so toss out that valve. Uh, or it can be considered in patients with aortic regurgitation uh, who may or may not have uh, associated dilatation. And this uh, applies both to dry leaflet and uh, uh, bicuspid valves. And of course you can have combinations of both. Now we, we've seen before about the normal uh, uh, root anatomy and basically the bottom line of how everything is organised is that we can get this coarctation zone in diastole that will stop the blood from leaking out. <coughs> in order for this to happen, we need to have a lot of orchestrated uh, three-dimensional things, but particularly the diameters at the sinotubular junction, at the annulus, and also the leaflet suspension or the free margin. Those three components account for uh, the majority of the normal function in diastole. So we can look at, at the effect of uh, enlarging the sinotubular junction diagrammatically if we stretch uh, the, the, the uh, root at that level, uh, it, it's quite clear that if we retain the same length of free margin that the leaflets won't be able to meet at the tip. Uh, what about annular dilatation? So we're down here now and as we enlarge the annulus, uh, at the start it doesn't affect it too much uh, because we, we've got a bit of overlap in the uh, leaflets. It's only when the annular dilatation gets to quite a significant degree that well, the leaflets won't meet anymore. And then the third component is the suspension mechanism of the valve or the free margin. Uh, if you have a, you know, an elongation of the free margin, uh, you produce prolapse of the leaflet. And this is particularly um, important when you've got um, uh, one out of the the three or the two leaflets that's more so than the others then even a little bit of a drop can result in uh, quite severe eccentric regurgitation. So our goals in uh, repairing the aortic valve are to try and restore the normal uh, degree of uh, coarctation which is really quite uh, very similar to what we're achieving in mitral valve repair. So um, we, we've got to correct the sinotubular junction and the annular dimensions appropriate to the available surface area of the valve. Uh, we've also got to make sure that the valve has got the appropriate suspension uh, length so that it ends up at the right height. But we also got to achieve this without compromising the ability of the leaflets to open so we don't train uh, regurgitation for stenosis. And finally, we've obviously got to remove all aneurysmal aorta. 
So for isolated sinotubular junction dilatation, um, this is a sort of situation where you see in patients who mainly have an ascending aneurysm that starts to creep in towards the sinuses. And, and that's, in those cases, the annulus is still well preserved. And it's a simple matter then to just replace the aneurysm and uh, re recorrect the sinotubular junction by using a piece of Dacron material. And you can see diagrammatically how that achieves confidence. If, on the other hand, you've got isolated annular dilatation, then you need some kind of a structure restriction at the annulus. And that can be achieved in a number of ways either using a special uh, Gore-Tex suture to run around the perimeter, uh, or the use of rings either internal or external. Unfortunately, most patients don't come with isolated uh, one or the other. And uh, uh, so then we need to have a multi-level correction, uh, ascending aorta, aortic sinuses, and quite commonly the aortic annulus. Um, and so we have these operations, the Akub and the David procedure. As far as uh, cusp prolapse is concerned, um, the, um, the, the correction of the, the prolapse, as you can see in this diagram, is to compare the abnormal leaflet to the other two and work out how much more that free margin is excessive and then produce a plication in the centre. And that's been shown to be the most effective way of correcting the uh, prolapse compared to um, either taking it out at the uh, commissure or uh, <coughs> fa fancier ways of doing it with Gore-Tex suture. So we, over the last uh, 20 years or so, we've had experience with just over 200 cases, uh, of which uh, three quarters were uh, trial leaflet and a quarter by cuspid. A slight, uh, many more males than females, and the median age was uh, 60. Uh, quite a lot of patients had associated surgery, and, and about 20% of the patients had uh, associated arch surgery. Our uh, complication rate, uh, so the mortality in, in elective isolated uh, repairs is zero in all that in all those patients, and um, and uh, even in all comers, including. Uh, those with emergencies and those with aortas, uh, we've had no deaths in the last 10 years. So for the whole series, the mortality is 1.9, um, which includes patients with acute dissection, two with arch repair, and one with uh, severe right heart failure. The uh, other complication rates are listed below and are quite low, uh, and uh, the in brackets refer to the isolated repairs. Uh, survival at uh, seven years, and the, just the next series of graphs we, we, we're lacking in the updating for the last 50 patients. So, the, the, just uh, a word of warning about this, they may, may shift from there, but I suspect it will be pretty similar from what I've seen. Um, so, we're surprised that a number of the deaths weren't uh, related uh, three cancer deaths, trauma, and uh, stroke from AF. <coughs> there was one endocarditis case which developed uh, quite late in the piece in a patient with cirrhosis. And one patient died of unknown reasons, uh, despite having a normal echo prior to death. Uh, freedom from uh, reoperation is about 90% in seven years. And we've reoperated on uh, seven patients. Interestingly, three have had uh, repairs, re-repairs. Uh, and that attests to the fact that um, we didn't get the technical aspect of the uh, operation right in the first uh, group of patients. Uh, the other four had uh, valve replacements. Uh, one of the deaths that occurred at reoperation, uh, in fact, the only deaths that occurred at reoperation, is that patient with endocarditis with root abscess. Um, this is the important number to look at freedom from any significant uh, aortic regurgitation. And uh, we've had 10 failures, uh, seven of which were re-operated on, and uh, three have been, uh, been called moderate, but uh, have no associated clinical features, and we're watching them at the moment. Uh, it's interesting that the failures have a different modal uh, presentation. So that the group that we saw up here <coughs> near, the, near the operation time tended to be the, the um, technical errors, where we didn't pay heed to particularly resuspension of the valve leaflets and ensuring that there's no problems. 
Um, then there's the middle group in the intermediate part, and this corresponds to the group when we got a bit cocky and thought we knew how to repair all valves and we took on uh, uh, borderline cases and we had patients come back with uh, uh, not regurgitation but stenosis from calcification. And hopefully we're now at a stage where we can select the patients well and do the operation well and hopefully end up with about a 90% long term. And this is what Tyrone David has shown in his series that's been out to, he quotes out to 20 years, but really out to 15 years, that they can get about 90% freedom from reoperation. What about the Ross procedure in this context? Well, we know the Ross operation is one a procedure that's been shown to have identical survival compared to an age-matched population. Um, However, the Achilles of uh, the ROS is the uh, reoperation rate, which can be as much as 10% in 10 years. But um, even though we can control this now and with the workings of, um, uh, of uh, Peter Skillington, and I'm sure uh, Marco will talk about this later, of containing the root to prevent the uh, autograft um, uh, development of uh, regurgitation, we still have the problem with the pulmonary valve. And we ideally wouldn't like to submit a patient to a second valve pathology when they didn't have it in the first place. <coughs> so, in our view, the role of the Ross operation in patients who are otherwise candidates is are those patients with poor leaflet quality, particularly those that have more than a mild degree of calcification or severe fibrosis. Uh, there are, there's also a subgroup of patients with an adequate quantity of tissue uh, they're particularly short leaflets in a tricuspid case. Uh, the, the sort of case I hate to see is uh, eccentric uh, AR in a tri-leaflet case with a short right coronary leaflet. Uh, all those with bicuspid that have a, uh, a cleft lip type appearance of their fused leaflet. So the lessons learned the hard way. <coughs> First and foremost, case selection. Uh, there's no point in taking someone on more than about 70 years of age, uh, my prosthetic valves do quite well. Same reason, we need to have reasonably good cardiac function and that leaflets need to be good to start with. <coughs> and also avoid multiple operations because the cross clamp time gets high and uh, unless cardioplegia is perfect, uh, you can end up with a low cardiac output state. So the ideal cases, particularly for those starting, is the trileaflet valve with central hour and uh, bicuspid with excessive um, tissue and prolapsing fused leaflet. Yeah, got to assess the, uh, the preopto and uh, the visual uh, inspection of the valve very carefully <coughs> to know what, uh, what you're dealing with. It's nice to see that you've got starting off with uh, a larger annulus and la larger STJ because you know you can make a big difference by bringing that down. Uh, pay heed to eccentric AI is really important. Calcification. And as I mentioned, what is the geometric length of the leaflets? The post-top uh, toe is, is absolutely mandatory and you need to have a very good uh, toe person to uh, look at this critically and not just uh, give you an okay. Uh, you've got to be able to have at, at most one plus uh, central AR. I, I, I hate any AR at all, but uh, at most one plus, and there's no, there should be no eccentric AR. That's not acceptable. You need a leaflet height of greater than eight millimetres, that, by that I mean is the distance from the base of the annulus to the tip of the leaflet, and a coaptation length, which is the distance over which the leaflets meet. <coughs> there should be no part of the leaflets below the annular plane and we don't accept gradients greater than 10. Really important to have a low threshold for recross clamping if you don't achieve those goals. Because quite often it's, it's a simple matter of letting out a stitch or adding an extra stitch in the uh, free margin to achieve a perfect result. So in conclusion, should we be repairing more valves? Um, I think we've shown that aortic valve repair is a safe alternative and it offers the potential for freedom from anticoagulation and other prosthetic valve complications. And it's certainly durable in the medium term and hopefully also in the longer term as Tyrone has shown. So the answer is a resounding yes, but 
you do need good case selection. And this is where it's really important to get in early before, the, just like mitral repair, before the valve has been damaged beyond repair. And this is particularly salient to the cases we're talking about with the early aortic root dilatation, the, <coughs> the genetic cases where um, if we don't wait to the five and a half centimetres, we may actually be able to salva, salvage their valve as well as repair their aorta. And of course, you do need operating team experience. Uh, it, is, it does have a learning curve and it'd be nice not to have to go through that like we did. Thank you very much.